before the advent of the road map. There was the Oedipus complex. The Oedipus complex is the hypothesis that an unconscious sexual tension underlies the relationship between mothers and sons. Ditto the Electra complex and the relationship between fathers and daughters. According to Freud's theory, fathers and daughters, mothers and sons, follow predictable behavior patterns, despite the fact that they themselves are unaware of the sexual contradictions that allegedly explain those patterns. Psychoanalysis reveals the underlying cause-effect reality and potentially occasions a healthy opportunity to modify. This may or may not fit. Architecture too has its psychopathologies. Architecture too may be amenable to a clinician's diagnosis which opens up opportunities for new architecture. And we have just such a diagnostician with us tonight. Here's the preliminary prognosis. Buried deep in architecture's 20th century unconscious is the ubiquitous North Sea oil rig complex. That's North Sea oil rig complex acronym NSORC. The NSORC persona is the extrovert. That archetypal persona looks not within itself but outside itself for confirmation of its purpose in the world. The architecture extrovert requires an a priori voice of authority and the 20th century architecture patient continues to provide himself with a psychologically comforting answer. NSORC, North Sea Oil Rig Complex, is the analog external truth architecture submits to validate its own meaning. But NSORC is a psychological prop and here's how the psychology works. An oil rig in the North Sea is a machine, an aggressive machine. Moving parts, rough concrete, rusted steel, subtend a constant ocean battering. The rig resolves a technical challenge. And the technical solution provides architecture with a, with a metaphor for the problem-solving linguistics and rationale it requires. The rig metaphor is architecture's surrogate voice of authority. Who we are, what we do, what we look like. The North Sea oil rig. Does North Sea oil rig cause and effect genuinely validate architecture's identity or is it possible that the more conceptually fundamental big cause, little effect, little cause, big effect, big cause, little effect, little cause, big effect is buried deeply under the rig? NSORC is an acronym for architecture's 21st century identity crisis. Oedipus claimed he didn't know his wife was his mother. Is contemporary architecture similarly disposed to disown a complex and contradictory parentage? Dr. Delanda will examine the patient. Dr. Delanda, I love that. Thank you very much for the mind-boggling introduction. <laughs> I'm already confused. 
Um, uh, I want to talk today about the new materialism and its relationship to consciousness, to awareness, to the mind. I realize that these are not necessarily terms that are synonymous with each other, but I don't want to make too fine, too, you know, too fine distinctions right now at this point. And uh, to introduce my talk, I want to start with a very powerful image. Basically, we have two basic traditions that we can use to think about the mind. One that goes back to Kant, the other one that goes back to Hume. And before I tell you what these two traditions are and how they relate to questions about materialism, I want to give you an image, an image to hold onto your mind. Now, I apologize in advance to Eskimos because I'm going to be stereotyping you people. But unfortunately, that is the example that has been used throughout the 20th century. And I want to use something that is already familiar. The question is this. Everybody knows that Eskimos have 29 words for snow. Now, that's not just something about Eskimos, skiers have seven or eight different words for snow. So it's just, it could be, I could use any example, and snow, of course, has absolutely nothing to do with, it, with the question at hand. The question is, though, given that Eskimos have 29 words for snow, do they see, do they experience 29 kinds of snow because they have 29 words for snow? In other words, the words in their heads like the signifiers in their heads cut out reality, which is basically amorphous, into 29 kinds of snow. They see those 29 kinds because they have the 29 words. Or they have 29 words for snow because they see, touch, smell, build igloos with and perform all kinds of non-discursive, non-linguistic practices on and with snow. Two entirely different things. In one, on one hand, the, the existence of those 29 words for snow in the Eskimos' heads make them or cause them to see things in a particular way. Language, structures, experience. The thesis of the linguisticality of experience. That goes all the way back to Kant. Or experience is about non-linguistic stuff. Building, touching, hunting, surviving storms. Telling your children, don't eat the yellow snow. <laughs> and when, there, when snow is part of your life, and a lot of your livelihood depends on noticing different combinations of the liquid and the solid. Will it sustain my weight? Will it afford me a surface to walk? Will it make a good building material for my igloos? That is the reason I'm using this example, you know, because of the thing that relates to architecture, the igloo thing. When snow is so much, such an important component of your life, such an important material component of your non-linguistic life, Synonyms tend to accumulate, just like we have now plenty of synonyms for cars or automobiles and so on, because automobiles are such an important part of our lives. And when synonyms accumulate, they tend to disappear, particularly when there's many of them, unless they acquire subtle shades of meaning so that they can mark very subtle distinctions between objective, mind-independent categories of snow or types of snow. Two entirely different theses. On one, language comes first and structures experience. Experience there, a world without language, a world without humans around and their signifiers in their heads is basically amorphous. It doesn't have any powers of morphogenesis by itself. It needs us to come and give it a stable form with our mental categories. That's Kant. On the other hand, what is stressed is everything that is non-linguistic. Non-linguistic practices. They are social practices, mind you. We're not talking about anything natural here. Social practices of construction, hunting, 
finding your way through different types of landmarks, all of which are covered with snow, and you may have to distinguish subtle uh, optical effects to be able to distinguish where, which way to go. And given the importance of a particular material, thanks to the importance of the material, then they end up with 29 words for snow. That is perhaps words that were synonyms, as I just said at some point before, but that now have acquired subtle shades of meaning, and that are very useful to communicate to new generations, to children, to train them into distinguishing those 29 kinds of snow, but they themselves do not make the, the, do not make the kinds of snow. The kinds of snow are objective and mind independent. That is Hume. So we have a very definite alternative here. And it is not a matter of, of, of whether language is important or not. Language is still important in a Humean view. It's just that language does not give form to the world. The world acquires its own form through its own morphogenetic process. That is, in fact, in essence, the new, the new materialism. The old materialism, as we all know, was associated with the name of Karl Marx, who in turn used as, as, a, as, a, as a philosophy of synthesis, as a philosophy of how to explain the synthesis of form in this mind-independent world, the ideas of Hegel. Hegel, in a very a priori way, that is, without performing experiments, a, 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 without a, a empirical evidence, on purely a philosophical grounds, postulated that there was only a, a single mode of synthesis of form. Of course, Marx had to then put, it, put him right side up, as Marx said, because Hegel did not believe in the mind independence of the world, but Marx did. And with that method of synthesis, which was basically the synthesis of opposites, the negation of the negation, you have the thesis, you have the antithesis, and from the, from the, from the conflict between the two, you get your synthesis, he established the first, the old materialism. The old materialism is dialectical materialism in, in his philosophy. It was, it, it, today we don't believe in that anymore. I, at least I don't believe in that anymore. I don't think there is a single piece of scientific evidence that dialectics is in fact a method of synthesis in nature. Nevertheless, the, the direction in which Marx was going was correct. If you are going to postulate a mind independent world, if you're gonna postulate that the form of clouds, of mountains, of animals and plants, of rocks and fire, are mind independent, then we need to explain what processes, what synthetic processes produced all those forms. If the mind is not gonna confer the world that order with signifiers and give it form, then the origins of form must be somewhere else. They have to be in processes of synthesis in nature. Now, the last three decades of the 20th century were very, very different the humanities and the hard sciences. Whereas the hard sciences finally discovered morphogenesis, finally discovered emergent properties, that is properties of a whole uh, that are a whole that is synthesized from its parts, but properties that are more than the sum of the parts, so the wholes are not mere aggregations of the parts, but are, are the result of a true synthetic process that creates something new. The last three decades of the 20th century discovered nonlinearity. We heard it a little bit mentioned in, in the introduction. Small causes that produce large effects, or large causes that produce small effects. That's nonlinear causality. We discovered nonlinear quasi causality of the attractor point, like a, a, a soap bubble that forms because. The, 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 it has a tendency to minimize surface tension, or if you want to put it in a different way, the population of soapy molecules in that film searches or, or has an inclination to find the minimal surface on which to wrap itself around. That type of morphogenesis with, with, which says that the world has its own form, that it doesn't need us to have form, and that doesn't need a god to come and tell it as if it was an inert piece of material, let there be light, let there be form, as a command from some psychic agency, 
that matter energy, which now we know is capable of self-organization, is what has come to replace dialectics as our new method of synthesis of form. So the last three decades of the 20th century saw chemistry, physics, biology, all embracing morphogenesis. All in, but of course, not in, in, in a single schema like dialectics, but in a, in, a, in a multiple set of schemas. We discover all kinds of different things, nonlinear causality, nonlinear quasi-causality, like of the soap bubble form, it, 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 it type. We, we began creating new materials. Uh, today, they, they say, you know, and this is what I'm teaching my students during the day, in, in the day class, the, the, the discipline of material science and engineering, which was a minor field, metal, a metallurgical department in some chemistry department somewhere before World War II, finally came on its own and is now studying both biological materials like spider silk or, or, or uh, physical materials, chemical materials, and inventing new combinations of this. We are in a golden age of materiality. The last three decades of the 20th century changed our very, the very way in which we look at materiality. It makes it impossible to look at matter as an inert material, that, as an inert receptacle for forms that come from the outside, from, from platonic heaven of essences, from the mind of God, or from signifiers in our head. The problem is that our theories of mind are lagging behind. We're still thinking that Eskimos see 29 kinds of snow, not because there are processes, objective processes that produce those 29 kinds, but because they have 29 words for snow. And so the last three decades of the 20th century were exactly the opposite for the humanities. Disciplines like cultural anthropology, uh, and basically the rest of the humanities, just about every field that ends up with the word studies, became deeply idealistic. Partly in an effort to deny the existence of essences. You know, if, if there are objects and processes that are mind independent, what guarantees their identity? Well, in the old fashioned realism, that was a possession of an essence, since possessions of an essence invokes a transcendental platonic space of archetypes, Part, the, in, part, in part, it's a rejection of the old materialism or the old realism. But they haven't obviously realized that the last three decades of the 20th century changed all that. That the old materialism and the old realism are dead. That no one believes in essences anymore. Uh, but that nevertheless, we have plenty of reasons to believe that there are morphogenetic or form generating processes out there, objective processes that give shape to the world and that they don't have to wait for us to come with our signifiers to structure that world. The world is not amorphous without us. The world had already a vibrant morphogenesis in terms of ecosystems, climate patterns, and so on, six million years ago when there were no humans around. To believe that we give form to the world is a form of creationism. It is, it is to deny the historicity of the human species and to assert that the world came into being the way we see it when we came into being, or even worse, when we acquired language, which is not even six million years ago, it's more like 50,000 years ago. So if you're gonna assert that the world acquired its form 50,000 years ago, you might as well buy the creationist number, 6,004 years ago. At least it's much more accurate, you know, 6,004. 6, not three, not two, but four. There is a certain religious smell to the ideas espoused by linguistic idealism. The problem is, given the incredible prestige and legitimacy attached to the name of Kant, it is not easy to get rid of it. Before I write this and contrast these two positions and then tell you a little bit about how artificial intelligence itself is reproducing this two, this dichotomy or this fight between these two positions, let me say something about Eskimos again. Well, okay, but let's assume that Eskimos do see 
29, I mean, they do uh, uh, have 29 words for snow because they have, 20, because they see and touch and build with 29 kinds of snow. Don't we still have to attribute to their minds meaning? Don't they go around their everyday lives attributing meaning to things and finding certain things meaningful and certain things non-meaningful? And that by itself introduces language into their very experience? The answer is no. And the answer is one day historians are going to laugh at us, or at least they're going to laugh at the humanities of the late 20th century, because they fail to distinguish two meanings of the word meaning. Now, all of you out there who are experts on irony are going to tell me this is not ironic. The experts on meaning, semioticians, didn't realize that the word meaning had two meanings. It kills me. What are the two meanings of the word meaning? Well, on one hand, we have signification. That's a linguistic thing. And I'm, again, I'm not denying the importance of language. I'm using language this very second to transmit these ideas. So clearly, language is important. Signification basically is a semantic question. When you ask somebody, what do you mean? You may ask, you know, there's a word in the sentence you just used that I didn't understand. So it might be a request for a definition. Define that word. Or you may know the meaning of all the words in the sentence, but the, the particular arrangement of the words may be ambiguous. And in, in which case, what do you mean is a request for a disambiguation. Those are perfectly two valid meanings of the word meaning. Definition and disambiguation, both are semantic. And they are about meaning in the old-fashioned sense of the word. But when you say, my life has no meaning, I feel meaningless, you don't really mean I need a dictionary definition. My life needs a dictionary definition. I need my life in the Webster Dictionary. And you don't mean, please disambiguate me linguistically. You mean, I don't feel like I make a difference. I don't feel important. I don't feel relevant. It's a matter of being significance. Significance, making a difference, can in some cases be related to language, as when we say that famous, I had a dream speech by Martin Luther King made a difference in the civil rights movement. A good speech like that can make a difference. But so can many other non-linguistic things. In fact, actions many times speak louder than words. As everybody knows, talk many times is cheap. Because you can say whatever you want. Yes, I promise I will support the strike. Yes, I promise I will be there. But you don't show up the following day to man the soup kitchen, or you don't show up and actually actively support that particular strike. And it doesn't matter what you say. Your actions say that it doesn't make any difference to you, that it is not a significant event to you. So when Eskimos go around attributing meaning to different types of snow, it is not signification that they are doing. They are attributing significance, importance. Are these properties of the snow important for building igloos? Are they relevant for me to give you warnings as to not walk in that particular snow? Does it make a difference that we distinguish this type of snow from this other type of snow? Making a difference, significance has nothing whatsoever or nothing inherently to do with language. And so yes, we are constantly attributing significance to our perceptions and the contents of our consciousness, but that doesn't mean that the thesis of the linguisticality of experience is true. So let's very fast. characterize these two styles of thinking about experience. The basic categories for Kant, as from, for Aristotle, as for just about any philosopher, are the general and the particular. 
I, of course, it is the possession of general concepts that allows me to attribute identity to the contents of my experience. So if I look at a chair, that particular set of pixels that is arriving at in my visual field would be an amorphous thing, would be something without any meaning, unless I have the general concept of a chair. If I have that concept, then I see that particular object under the category chair. I classify it as a chair, and therefore I see it as a chair. It's a very powerful idea. And the general and the particular are two important categories. Hume takes an entirely different approach. Given a field of, of raw sensations, feelings, and so on, you know, intensities, intensities of color, intensities of sound, intensities of aroma, intensities of texture, intensities of temperature, intensities of pressure, intensities of speed. Given that field of raw sensations, we organize it not by projecting general concepts on it, but by making habitual associations. He distinguished three types of associations. Whenever I see two things that always tend to go together in space, for instance, as a baby, when I see my mother's face and the nose tends to always be underneath the eyes, most mothers are like that, and the eyebrows are on top of the eyes, and next time I see the face, the eyebrows are on top, but the nose is underneath. Those have it, the habit of seeing that constancy of, of, of a spatial contiguity makes me start attributing a certain constancy to that face. Now I know that that is an object that has a certain identity because certain relations of spatial continuity, contiguity, I can associate certain features by sp spatial contiguity. There's also temporal contiguity as in the cause and effect relationship. I light up a match, put it next to a piece of paper, the piece of paper goes on fire. Lit match plus paper causes fire. So it's just cause and effect. The constant conjunction of a cause and its effect allows me to start attributing significance to certain associations. Not meaning in the linguistic sense, but significance. And finally, resemblance. If two things look alike today, and the two things look alike tomorrow, and the two other things look alike tomorrow, then I see them as, as always looking alike. It's just habit. Hume is not saying we are doing anything transcendental here. The very fact that he boils it down to habit, to routine, shows you that what he is saying is that your routine non-linguistic practices, those non-linguistic practices you repeat day after day, is what endows your world with significance, not with linguistic meaning. Now, the 20th century was a century of Kant, as far as the humanities is concerned, of course. In fact, the position is called Neo-Kantian, because it's not Kant himself who makes an appearance in the 20th century. It's, his, it's, his, it's, the, it's, it's Kant plus the thesis of the arbitrarity of the signifier that goes back to Saussure. Now, I completely agree with that thesis. There's absolutely nothing in the string of sounds S-N-O-W that makes it refer to snow. After all, the string of sounds N-I-E-V-E, -E, nieve, in Spanish, refers to snow. It's an entirely different string of sounds. So there's nothing inherent in the string of sounds that makes that referential a, a possibility. 
So once you put together Kant with it, the arbitrary the, of the signifier, you get the, your basic neo-Kantian position. Just about everybody in the 20th century that matters was neo-Kantian. Heidegger and Husserl, Derrida and Kristeva, Baudrillard, some, some, at some moments Foucault, Foucault who brought us non-linguistic non practices like torture, surveillance, monitoring. He failed to carry through and at some points becomes neo-Kantian. In fact, the only philosopher that I can think of in the 20th century that was not neo-Kantian is Gilles Deleuze. And perhaps some of the people that Gilles Deleuze himself adores and, 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 and writes about, such as Bergson, Marlou Ponty. But he is the only one who sided unequivocally with Hume. In fact, the very first book written by Deleuze was a book on Hume. That's how he started his publishing career. He wanted to make a statement because it is important to take sides in this, this, in this fight. You cannot have it both ways. You either see 29 kinds of snow because you have 29 words for snow or vice versa. There is no intermediate thing there. Now what's interesting, despite the fact that Hume was the loser of the 20th century, in the humanities anyway, and that Kant clearly was the winner in, this, in his neo-Kantian incarnation, artificial intelligence is beginning to revive the debate. Artificial intelligence is, of course, closely related to robotics, closely related, related to the enterprise of trying to get some kind of a mind, at least some kind of an animal mind at the level of, say, mammals or birds, to emerge from silicon chips, from software running on silicon chips, from matter. And is divided into two quite different schools. Symbolic AI, in which everything is about the general and the particular, and in which everything is about symbols, hence the term. And connectionist. Artificial intelligence, the main devices that it builds are called neural nets. I'm going to explain how they work in a second. Neural nets, just to, just to give you the, uh, the contrast, are not programmed. You don't program a neural net. There's not a single bit of software that runs on a neural net. Neural nets are trained. They are trained like you train a dog to catch a frisbee, or the way you train a circus animal to perform certain acts. And neural nets are, at the, at the very bottom of it all, associationist devices. That is, they are entirely human. What's good about this, in terms of the battle between human and Kant, is that because we've had software that, that goes with the symbolic artificial By software, I don't necessarily mean just software programs written in BASIC or Pascal or C, as we've had them since, since the 50s. Rather, any kind of algorithm, any kind of mechanical recipe that guarantees results. So we can go, for instance, all the way back to Aristotle's syllogism. All humans are mortal. I am human. And then the, the software, just from those two things, derives I am mortal. That is most, one of the most famous pieces of software in the world. It lasted for 2,500 years unaltered. All humans are mortal. I am human. Therefore, this is what the software produces, I am mortal. Now, if you don't find that very exciting, it's because it isn't. But imagine it with 29 <laughs> words first not with 29 sentences, or 30, 40 sentences, then your mind would boggle because you would not know how to, how to program the syllogism as a piece of software can reach the final conclusion just fine. 
this is an example of what is called deductive logic, the earliest, the earliest algorithm for deductive logic. Deductive logic is simply software that moves truth from general sentences to particular sentences. That's all it does. But it does it in an algorithmic, mechanical, results guaranteed kind of way. An infallible mechanical recipe. Since it's 2,500 years old, and it was not replaced until the middle of the 19th century by first Boolean logic, and then the, the logic invented by Frege and Bertrand Russell, it has the most legitimacy of all the algorithms. It really has a long stretch of time in which it was the dominant piece of software. And all it does, as I said, is take truth from general sentences and via one particular sentence transmits it automatically to another particular sentence. The beginning of symbolic artificial intelligence was equally deductive. They thought this was thinking. And so they try to create deductive algorithms. In fact, they were already around. As I said, Bertrand Russell had invented a very powerful deductive logic, the predicate calculus, which eventually became part of the foundations of new computer languages and so on. On the other hand, we have what is called inductive logic. Both of them are entirely linguistic. They are not about meanings. They are about truth. But truth is a semantic property of sentences. So we're still completely within the realm of language. Inductive logic performs the opposite operation. It transmits or moves truth, truth and falsehood, by the way, because just truth values in general. If this was false, the falsehood would also be transmitted by the algorithm. Inductive logic transmits truth in the opposite direction, from particular sentences to general sentences. This, you know, you're, you're, talk, you're seeing a bunch of jewels in front of you, and you go, this emerald is green. That's a particular sentence. This emerald is green. This emerald is also green. All emeralds are green. That would be an example of inductive logic. You're going from many particular truths to a general truth. Clearly, for artificial intelligence, inductive logic is much more important because it's basically learning from experience. This chihuahua dog is obnoxious. This other chihuahua dog is obnoxious. This other chihuahua dog is obnoxious. All chihuahua dogs are obnoxious. Now, I'm not going to dispute the absolute truth of that sentence. <laughs> and you learn those sentences via inductive logic. The problem is no one has come up with an infallible mechanical recipe. No one has come up with an algorithm to perform inductive logic symbolically. Apparently, learning from experience is a different thing than we thought it was. Nevertheless, our symbolic artificial intelligence has had its triumphs, despite having hit an impasse with inductive logic. And in particular, its most important triumph is called expert systems. The, 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 the original expert systems were created in the 60s from, for very narrow fields of experience. The basic idea was this. Why do we have to teach a computer to learn from experience from scratch? In other words, if there, uh, let me just backtrack a little bit. If there is no algorithm, if there is no infallible mechanical recipe to transmit truth from particular sentences to general sentences, then why don't we use not algorithms but heuristics? Heuristics are also mechanical recipes or recipes, procedures, but that are not infallible. Heuristics take judgment when you apply them. Heuristics basically means rules of thumb. You've learned something when you're performing a particular fixing your toilet or something, and then you, you realize that you can apply similar thinking to something else. And so you carry your rules of thumb with you. But the question for artificial intelligence was, where do we get our rules of thumb? And so some brilliant knowledge engineer, as they call themselves, thought, well, why don't we actually bring actual experts, actual doctors, actual chemists, and so on, interview them, force them to articulate their unarticulated knowledge, and then 
arrange all everything we get out of them into if, then, else statements in what is called a knowledge base and get, give all those heuristics to the robot or to the expert system. Let me just, before I continue this, let me make another distinction that is, that is very important. This is a distinction that was made by a philosopher in the 1940s. His name is Gilbert Ryle. Whose work is still very much, it has, been, it has not been exploited enough. It's one of those forgotten philosophers that, that is just begging to be revived. Gilbert Ryle was very, very famous in his time. This, you know, he chastised philosophers for always thinking about knowledge in linguistic terms. He said, yes, of course, linguistic knowledge exists. Declarative sentences, sentences that state a fact, all humans are mortal, for instance, are carriers of truth and therefore are knowledge. This is what knowing that is. Knowing that Columbus discovered America in 1492. Knowing that the Yankees won the World Series in 2002. It doesn't matter if it's true or false. As long as it's a declarative sentence, a fact-stating sentence, it fits the blank here. And knowing that sentence, is having it in your head, is part of what knowledge is. Right? He's not denying that. What he's denying is that that is all that knowledge is. And then he postulated the existence of an entirely different type of knowledge, knowing how, in which the blank is filled by a verb denoting an activity, knowing how to ride a bicycle, knowing how to swim. To learn how to, is, is knowledge that is acquired by doing, and that if it's taught, it's taught by example, not by telling you things. You don't start giving your child a theoretical you know, exposition about bicycles and then throw them downhill. You know, good luck, kid. He or she has to make an assemblage with the artifact itself, with a piece of solid ground and a gravitational field, with the physicality of the bicycle, and learn how to ride a bicycle in his or her own body. And that's a kind of know-how that doesn't go away. You don't ride a bicycle for a long time. You mount a bicycle, and it just comes right back. Knowing how to swim. You have to make an assemblage with the water and, and, and find out how certain rhythmic motions of your limbs will propel you or will allow you to float. Many things that are necessary for language to work in a, in a, liter, in a, in a literate society, knowing how to read, knowing how to write, are know-how, not know that. So even though we need language to speak about skills, as I'm doing right now, we need skills to use language. So the two interact with one another and, and, and support one another. What the expert systems people wanted to do was to take the know-how of doctors. They know how to make a diagnosis. They've learned that by experience. They know that certain particular sentences like, this person has this and this symptoms, or this person has symptom A. The same person has symptom B. The same person has symptom C. Therefore, he or she has the flu, or she or she has hepatitis B, or a particular diagnosis. In other words, you start with the particular symptoms, and you move up to a general diagnosis. That would count as inductive logic, because you're moving from the particular to the general. However, most doctors learn that as know-how. You know, many, many times, particularly when it is not something that has already become routine and has made it into textbooks, you need to extract this know-how from them. This is what knowledge engineers did and one of their main triumphs. How to interview an expert, how to force that expert to articulate his or her know-how into know that, into sentences, and then record those sentences, put them in the right, in the right form so that, so that they can become software, if then statements are the typical form. If this symptom is and this other symptom is, then this is a diagnosis. And by extracting know-how or rules of thumb from doctors, chemists, and other experts, they managed to get the most successful symbolic artificial intelligence products out there today. Today, expert systems work. They are trusted by, by practitioners. They are more like idiot savants 
than intelligent systems because they know about just one field very well and they break down the moment you leave that field. Nevertheless, they work and they are trusted by the experts themselves. They're used in hospitals, they're used in chemical laboratories, they're used in the different fields for which they have been written. Nevertheless, and even though this is a triumph for symbolic artificial intelligence, don't you get the feeling that they cheated? They are using the bodies of humans who have acquired know-how in an entirely different way, in an entirely non-symbolic way, and then they are using that as a shortcut to end up with symbols. But why don't we have something that explains what know-how is without having to go through symbols? Well, that is what connectionism does. This is the Kantian tradition. It's still very much alive. It will be, be, be very much alive for the next 50 or so years. But Hume is starting to shine through, thanks to neural nets. Neural nets, for the first time, have created a technological paradigm, a technological exemplar of what it is to think about associations without any symbols whatsoever. As I said, neural nets are trained. They are not programmed. So even those words that go into programs like if, then, are not present in neural nets at all. How do they work? Let us begin with the simplest neural net design called the perceptron. Simply a pattern associator. Neural nets work with patterns. They are pattern associators, pattern completers. They reason with patterns. They can put several patterns together. Physical patterns, visual patterns, patterns in uh, sound patterns, aroma patterns, as in, as in a good wine that has a certain, certain combination of aromas and a certain pattern of nutty and fruity and, and so on. Patterns, textural patterns, any kind of physical pattern. Now, the existence of those patterns I'm going to take to be non-problematic right now because all the sciences, the, the, all the, science, the sciences behind the new, new, the new materialism have already shown how those patterns emerge. They emerge through self-organization. They are emergent patterns that come from the interaction between elements and are non-reducible to those parts. So the patterns exist. The question now is, in a world that was full of patterns, how did animals and their nervous systems came to acquire enough ability, enough skill, to use those patterns to guide themselves in their everyday activities. A perceptron works like this. It typically has a certain number of computing units, very, very simple computing units. Normally, you, you diagram them as little circles, called the input units. And in this particular simplest case, a number of other computing units known as the output. Now, these are extremely simple computing units. They are not nearly as complex as a CPU inside your personal computer. All they can do, in fact, is compute how excited or inhibited they are given their relationships to the excitation that comes from other units. All these units can do is excite and inhibit one another. That's all. It's a, it's a physical thing, excitation, inhibition. Now, if you don't think that you can compute with excita excitation and inhibition, just look at bees in a, in a beehive or ants in an anthill. They compute effectively and without any centralized agency computing the shortest path to the closest source of food, and they bring the food to the colony. They can perform all kinds of tasks as a superorganism simply by inhibiting or exciting one another via pheromones. Termites are even a better case because termites actually build architectures. They build arches in their nests. And as every architect knows, building an arch is a hard thing. How, you know, it, it, people, uh, scientists have made studies of the DNA of termites and, and ants to see if the information to build those patterns is in fact in the DNA. And they have found that it wouldn't fit in their DNA. And that therefore it's an emergent property of the interaction between the ants. As they excite and inhibit one another, something emerges, some kind of collective intelligence in the ant hill. Well, neural nets work via that kind of collective intelligence. This is the simplest pattern, I mean, the simplest design. 
The input units are all connected to every single output unit. Every input unit is connected to all of them. I'm not going to draw all the connections because it would take me forever. I want you to imagine them, and so on and so forth. The connections have a weight. In other words, they can transmit more inhibition or less inhibition, or more excitation or less excitation. They are similar to the synapses between our neurons, which can excite other neurons with more intensity or excite the other neurons with less intensity. At the beginning, when you're going to train your neural net, all the weights are the same. They are kind of at, at a mid-value. Mid if the maximum value is 1, they would be at something like 0.5. And so everything is connected to everything else with a, with a kind of average ability to transmit excitation and inhibition. Then you connect these input units to a camera or some kind of input device that's going to give you an image. And you connect the output units to some kind of motor that is going to create the motor behavior. The idea here is to match a pattern of sensations, a pattern, a visual pattern, for instance, in the case of a camera, to a response, to a motor pattern. So, and so what you do is this. The information that comes from the camera excites certain, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put them in black, the ones that get excited. And the ones that don't get excited, I'm going to leave in white. So, so excite some. Imagine that it's a black and white camera, just to make this simpler. Creates a pattern of excitation at the input units. And then the experimenter determines what behavior it wants the neural net to have. That is, the experimenter determines a pattern of output units. This might seem like cheating, but it is not. When you train an animal, when you train a circus animal, for instance, it is the trainer that decides that the, the correct, you know, the, what the correct output is going to be. You know, for the seal, for instance, to have a, 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 a ball, you know, spinning in, 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 on its nose or something. The animal doesn't make that decision. All you do is give him a reward if it approaches the right output, the right motor pattern. And here, then, you. What the, the basic principle is this. Neurons that fire together wire together. In other words, at the beginning, all of them are connected by the same weights. But if two tend to fire together during the training procedure, their connection becomes strengthened. And two that do not tend to fire together in the training procedure, the connection becomes negated, becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. So at the end of the training procedure, you end up with a, with a pattern of synapses, with a pattern of intensities, or a pattern of weights in the connections. Now you can withdraw the output pattern, and every time you present you know, once, once the information necessary to reconstruct this pattern is coded into those, into those uh, uh, synapses, into those connections, you can now present the input pattern, and the neural net will automatically generate the output pattern. This is what, that's, this is what it means by saying that it is a pattern associator. It associates a pattern, a visual pattern, with a motor pattern. Now, that is the simplest type of neural net and yet it already has certain properties that are important. Think of it, for instance. In symbolic artificial intelligence, memories, that is the memory of a computer, is a bunch of symbols which have an address. This is how symbols are stored in you know, file names and file the contents of files and so on in your hard drive. Every piece of your hard drive has an address and so if you want to retrieve something from memory in the symbolic paradigm, you retrieve it by its address. But our brain doesn't have an address. Our brain recalls past memories via their content. So if you were in a very nice cabin with a fire going, and there was snowing outside, and there was a certain type of music, and you were with, with, with your girl, and then many years later, you see just the fire or you see just the snow, or the same song plays again, pow, the whole memory comes back together. Memories in a human mind are content addressable. 
They are, they are retrieved by pieces of their content, not by a numerical address like in symbolic computers, in serial computers. The same thing goes here. Because now the, the information is really stored in the synapses, in the weights of the synapses. If this guy was missing, for instance, and this one too, as long as one or two or the units are active and begin sending excitation, in many cases, that is enough to retrieve the entire output pattern. In other words, a piece of the memory, just like the fire or the song or even the smell of wood burning, can retrieve that the entire contents of your memory. Here, the same thing happens. Another important characteristic, the patterns themselves are not being stored. This is something like philosophers like Bergson and other philosophers of memory have been claiming about the human mind for the longest time. We don't store representations of biographical episodes. What we store are the means to reproduce those original scenes in our head. And the same thing here. Nothing is stored in the units. When you train the, the same perceptron to store yet another pattern, those patterns disappear. What is stored is the pattern of weights, the pattern of synaptic connections or the synaptic strengths that will be enough given a certain input to reconstruct the output, to re regenerate or reproduce the output. This is closer to a Bergsonian theory of memory than it is to a symbolic theory of memory in which what we have in our head are representations. Now, the perceptron was attacked in the, am I running out of time? Someone is making signals to me. OK, well, let me, let me then start approaching the end here. The perceptron was attacked in the 1960s because, of course, science as my students already know, because we had a class about this, is not socially neutral. Science occurs within a social matrix in which legit questions of legitimacy, questions of prestige, questions of allocation of resources are always there and very prominent. If a particular field of science gets its resources cut in half because another field is getting those resources, there's going to be fights. And it happened here in the 1960s, too symbolic artificial intelligence people, Minsky and Papert, wrote a book called The Perceptron, where they completely demolished the abilities of those very, very simple de de devices as, as, as the future of artificial intelligence. Now, they, don't, they didn't lie at all in their, in their book. It's a very good book, and it does establish the limits of the simplest of designs. But they made the mistake, of course, of thinking that the simplest of the signs was the last word on the subject. Today, we have a proliferation of the signs of neural nets, incredibly complex ones that can perform all kinds of tasks. And the original criticisms by Minsky and Papper are not valid anymore. And yet, many symbolic artificial intelligence people, influenced by Kant, continue to insist that those criticisms are valid. Minsky and Papper were, of course, simply reacting to where do you get your money from? Artificial intelligence was mostly funded by DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Programs Agency, a kind of a think tank created to promote certain military technologies. And later on, they, they took out the D, and it was to pr promote any kind of technology that could give the United States an edge in a global competition. There was very powerful competition for those limited funds. Minsky and Papa wrote their paper so that there would be no money going into connectionism. And connectionism languished throughout the 60s and 70s. In the 1980s, though, it made a big comeback. It made a, a big comeback because in addition to the input units and the output units of the old paradigm, or the, sim or the simplest of the signs, there were now many layers of what is called hidden units. And this changed the game altogether. With two or three layers of hidden units, the neural net is itself capable of extracting similarities among the patterns. In particular, you show a neural net with hidden units, 
a photograph of one dog, a photograph of a different dog, a photograph of a very different dog, and it extracts a prototype. It doesn't extract the essence of dogness, because there is no essence of dogness. Any animal species is just a historical evolutionary construction that is every, much as, every bit as contingent as the organisms that belong to that species. And particularly dog races, dog races are not very stable. If you don't care, if you don't control who your dog does the nasty with, you end up with a chihuahua dog or something. Yeah. You wouldn't really want that to happen. Hidden units can extract similarities from the input. And on their own, it's a self-organizing paradigm. And by extracting prototypes, they can now represent another one of Hume's associations. In fact, all three Hume, of Hume's associations, association between cause and effect, that is, a, 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 a const, the constant conjunction in time of a cause and its effect, contiguity in time, contiguity in space, and resemblance have already been reproduced with neural nets. So what's interesting about neural nets, again, is that for the first time it gives us a, a, a technological paradigm of what know-how is, of what that non-linguistic type of knowledge is, which is, of course, what we need to explain why Eskimos can see, touch, build igloos with 29 kinds of snow. They can extract those prototypes from actual combinations of the solid and liquid state of water, which gives you different emergent properties for the snow. And, you, and by, by practice, by habit, by routine, and by developing special skills, such as igloo building skills, they can now extract prototypes from those categories without any linguistic words being uh, as an intermediate, and end up later on assigning a particular word, one of those synonyms that acquire a subtle shade of meaning, assigning a particular meaning to that so that it can be easily memorizable. In fact, one of the, one of the things that has come out of this debate is that may, we may very much be a combination of Kantian and Humean machines. We wear for the longest time of our hunter-gathering experience, that is all those 200 or 300,000 years since we speciated as homo sapiens before we acquire language, which is a much more recent acquisition, is at the most 50,000 years old. We were already polishing stones, we were already hunting, we were already having social relationships like a division of labor, we already had social norms like the distribution of food in a more or less fair way among the hunter-gatherers without words. We needed something to do justice to that part of our humanity, to the part of a humanity that, that had a different type of intelligence, skills, know-how. So neural nets for the first time, like giving us that capacity, the capacity to reproduce that in a, in a device, and therefore are offering us a very concrete exemplar on how to think about that with our representations. Now, just to, to end the, the talk, what's even more amazing is that when you compare the findings of the hard sciences, physics, chemistry, biology of the last 30 years in processes that have nothing to do with intelligence, in the organization of turbulent vortices in the, in the climate or in, 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 in weather patterns, the eruption of volcanoes, the, the convection cells made out of lava that, tra that, that transport the continents and make them, or the plates on which the continents are embedded and make them clash with one another to create the Himalayas, the self-organization of biological tissue in an embryo which may be directed by genes, but there's all kinds of things that emerge spontaneously. All those discoveries having to do with the, with the presence of nonlinear relationship between the parts and the emergence of properties that are more than the sum of the parts, the exact same mathematics and the exact same models apply to neural nets. Neural nets are also dynamical systems when they recognize a pattern, when they, after being trained, they settle into a, into a particular pattern of activity, a particular pattern of excitation. Once excitation waves travel through all the synapses, through the hidden layers, and so on, 
waves of excitation can travel back and forth until they settle into a particular pattern. In other words, neural nets self-organize just like weather patterns self-organize, just like ant colonies self-organize, just like geological constructions self-organize, which is an incredibly coherent result. We evolved, we and our ancestors, animal ancestors, whether chimpanzees or the ancestors of chimpanzees, and then mammals and reptiles and so on, in a world that was already filled with self-organized patterns.